Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Academy of Animated Art live session here. Um, I'm going to try something new tonight. Uh, we're going to try a new series. We're going to call it Mikey Lights It. Um, that might just be my quarantine brain thinking that one's funny. It may not be, but if you guys like, then we can go ahead and go with that. Um, make sure we're all set up here on Facebook Live. It looks like we're going strong. So hello, Asha. I see you over here on Facebook. It's very good to see you. And for anyone who's on Zoom, let's see who's on Zoom. We've got Francesca over here on Zoom. How's it going? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of explain a process of setting up at the ACES workflow in Arnold and Nuke. I'm going to talk about it a little bit, and then I'm going to take, through, take you through a lighting setup, the little scene that I put together there. Um, but we will, uh, so, but as I'm going through things, if you all have any questions at all, you can pop them in zoom. If you want to pop them in the chat window or the Q and a area, I can check either if you're hello, Pasqua, um, it's good to see you too. And if you're in Facebook, feel free to throw your comments in the comment section. Um, I will be checking those later so I can answer questions as I go through. Um, Facebook is just tough because it'll just be on a different screen than what I'm working on. So I won't necessarily see it right away, but get, definitely go ahead and plug in your questions and I'll be able to answer those as we go. So without much further ado, we're going to go ahead and share my screen here and I'll go ahead and share, I'll just share all of it. Sorry. Uh, so now you can see everything that I'm seeing on my screen here. So yeah, so this is our scene. Um, this is something that I'm putting together. So. One of the things that I'm going to be, actually, let me uh, hide my video here. So one of the things that we're going to be putting together here at the Academy of Animated Art is a very intro to Maya course or intro to 3D course. And so what I did was I just kind of wanted to build a very simple room because the idea of the course is like learn Maya in an hour. So I'm going to be putting that together soon. And so I just wanted to be able to like do a quick model with a quick shader and some quick lighting just to get people off the ground and get them over that hump of being intimidated by Maya. So we're gonna go ahead and light up this scene real quick and I'll just take you guys through a couple different light sources like lighting up this computer, doing some external lighting, lighting up this lamp, as well as like using these stars as a light source. But the first thing I wanted to talk to you all about was the ACES workflow. So what is ACES? ACES is, um, it's the Academy Color Encoding System. What does that mean? Uh, it's a free, basically it's a free system uh, developed under the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences that will help you, um, basically it's a color space worker. And what that means is that when we're lighting something and we're working in CG, we are forever fighting to get more information, more data, more value into each pixel so that we can have more control over it throughout the process. Um, what ACES does, it's a color management system that allows you to, um, here, let's see, let's take a look at the gamut. So for those that don't know what gamut is, uh, including myself for a long period of time, um, so what we're looking at here is, is, is this like shape of colors is all the possible colors that can be shown um, in an image, in a, uh, like, I forget what it is, it's like a floating point image, right? What these triangles are, are the visible spaces of these different, this is the gamut that each one of these encoders allows you to see. So like this ACES 26-2065-1 uh, allows you to see the entire gamut. ACES CG allows you to see this much of it. REC 709, which is what a lot of people use, allows you to see even less of it. So the more you can see, the more colors can be interpreted, the the more area of flexibility that you have. So this comes up a lot in uh, when you're making films because different viewing methods have different gamuts. So like if you're displaying something on a digital projector versus film projectors versus DVDs. So ultimately when you're producing a film, like a major motion picture, they will have to out, they'll do go through this process of color timing where they color time, like I think it's like 17 different versions of the film depending on if you're doing like DVD or Blu-ray or Laserdisc, or if you're doing it in stereo or mono, if you're doing different digital projectors, it's crazy. All to accommodate this gamut or these different, um, these different images. So where does ACES really help out? So Katarina, if you're on, thank you very much for posting this doc, Katarina, because this is very good. Uh, this is a setup doc that I'll, um, you know, 
I'll have you guys on live now. I will go ahead and post it to this video now. Hi, Lee. How's it going? So there's the doc there. Um, this doc will show you the setup that I will walk you through here in just a second, as well as the setup if you're working in Blender or in Substance or earlier versions of Nuke or in Photoshop or things like that. So, but what this does is this kind of shows you uh, some of the differences between what it looks like in sRGB versus uh, ACES uh, CG. So you can see there's just like more value, more variation in the highlights. That's gonna be the biggest thing that you're gonna get out of this. Um, because if you take an sRGB image and like you really pump a lot of sunlight in there as you would in a scene like this, and you guys remember the scene, you have access to this through the, our asset library. This is um, uh, Jeremy Vickery and, uh, oh man, Matthias Teo, I think what his name was. Um, yeah, really beautiful scene, great stuff. You can find it in our asset library. Um, and what it is is like you're pushing a lot of sunlight in there. It's bouncing up and around. Um, if you take this sRGB image and you try and tone it down in Nuke, all these values will be kind of crushed, especially in here. So everything will just be like flattened out as one. And then as you pull it down, it'll just kind of gray out. Where this has a lot more uh, value in it. And when you pull it down, they'll maintain some variation. So let me uh, show you how to do that. And then I'll give you a disclaimer at the end. So the biggest thing that you want to do, and this Arnold workflow, it, does, it sets this up really well. Um, the first thing that you want to do is you want to go to the GitHub page. Let me get back to this. So I can open this in a new tab so I can, so slow. So you uh, just want to open this in a new tab here. So this is the GitHub page. Um, you can go and download, as long as you're logged in, you can download the, all the ACES stuff. Uh, it's just a file that you want to just throw somewhere on your computer and then you can go into your Maya scene. Uh, you go into your settings and preferences and you go into plugin manager. Oh wait, nope, that's not true. That's wrong. Windows, settings and preferences, you go into your preferences. And then you go down here to color management. And from there, you're going to want to check the U, uh, use OCIO color or configuration. And then you're going to want to put your path to that ACES file. I, I, I chose the, uh, this 1.0.3 uh, config from your file. You just go and you select it here. And then what you want to do is you want to make sure that your rendering space is in the CG, that you're, that you're viewing it in sRGB ACES. And then um, you have a choice down here to either and it explains this in the doc why you would choose one or the other, but you have a choice down here of whether you want to set this up as the OCIO standard or your default. I just left it as the default. Um, if you set it up as a standard, you can, you can go in and do some customization. I chose to keep things as simple as possible, so I did not do that. And that's basically it. So Arnold will pick up those changes. Um, and then in, in this doc as well, um, I haven't gotten to that, but in this doc as well, it'll talk you through setting up a, a regular expression to uh, help with, where's that at? Um, to help with anything that's a normal map. So uh, that's, a, that's a pretty handy little one as well, um, so that you don't put that in the wrong filter. The one thing I will say when I was testing this out is that if you're rendering anything with a texture map and you've already generated a TX map, like if you're an Arnold, you, you generate those TX files. Um, you'll want to, I, I, I found that you will want to delete those and then recreate those with ACES because if they were already created using an old color space, they won't be accurate when you do it again. Um, and then as far as Nuke goes, it was, it was really super easy. So all, you know, if, if I'm over here in my file, um, all I have to do is hit the S key to open up my uh, project settings. And then what you want to do is go into your color tab and under management, you want to switch it from nuke to OCIO. Um, and then you want to make sure that it, this, whatever ACES version you're using again, 1.0.3 uh, matches that. And then you can change, like I just left my working space again, the scene linear of the ACES CG, uh, my monitors sRGB. I could go, yeah, within ACES. So that's, that's what my monitor is. I just have a little MacBook here. Um, and then you can, you can change these as well based on your monitor, based on your setup. But that is pretty much it. Um, and uh, let me stop and make sure we don't have any questions. Looks like we're good here. Let me check the Facebook. 
Are you downloading all the files on that link or just the OCIO? I was downloading all of them. Um, they're very, very small. There's really not a lot to it. So in this folder, I just, I just click download and downloaded all of them. Um, again, they're just, yeah, they're just some simple files. So I don't, I mean, you can delete them, I guess. Like, I guess you probably wouldn't need these older configs if you're just using this one, but, um, yeah, there's more. And just so you guys know, there's definitely more to it than, than I'm laying out. Um, you know, this is a very deep topic. It's very scientific. It dives deep into, um, into a lot of different things. And actually, let me stop sharing my screen for a second because I want to talk to you guys about this one for a second. So the biggest thing that I see, and, and we've, we've seen a lot of like, a lot of people were like, you know, because I've, I've been offering up like, hey, let me know what you guys want to learn. And I thought people were going to be like, hey, I want to learn how to light this thing or like this technique would be really cool. And I got a lot of people asking about ACEs. Totally fine. No problem. I got no problem talking about this stuff. But the one thing I want to make sure that everyone knows is that ACEs or linear workflow or your super souped up computer with a new GPU car that's going to run the, the raddest, coolest new render engine, that's not the stuff that's going to help you make beautiful images. It'll help like a little, like it'll help you work faster. Um, it'll help you like control some of the high end values like I was just showing. Like that stuff's great. But until you have a solid artistic foundation to know what it is that you're looking for, or even to get the image like most of the way there, all of that technical stuff does not matter. Like it really, really, really doesn't. Like we were making some really beautiful images in this industry long before any of this stuff. Like go back and watch Wally. -E. That thing was dope. And they, there's like no linear workflow. Um, they weren't even using ray tracing fully then. Like <laughs> they, Pixar didn't start using ray tracing fully until Monsters U, I think, was the first one they did all ray tracing, which Pat Peeve, they claim is the first film ever to do that. Not true. Blue Sky did it long before then, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, but my point being is that it's so easy to get wrapped up because you read these forums and these articles and you're like, yeah, man this thing is like super cool. It's going to change the way that we work. And, and, and yeah, sure. Whatever. Like it, it'll, it'll certainly helps, like I said, but it's not the thing that's going to get you a job. It's not going to be the thing that makes uh, it's, it feels when we talk, when Jasmine and I talk about like, Hey, watch out for people who like look out for that make pretty button. Aces is like the, the thing today. That's like, Oh, if I just get that workflow set up, everything will be cool. And people that are showing their stuff in aces and it looks great. It's not because of aces it's because they're cool artists, like, cause they're really good artists. So that's, that's, that's my rant. Um, and so I just want to make sure to hop on over here, see if there's any other questions before I move on to actually lighting it. All right, cool. So that's a quick and dirty aces setup from somebody who doesn't like doing that stuff. <laughs> um, okay. Let me go ahead and share my screen. We'll get into lighting a little bit. The thing that I do like to do. Um, Okay, show this. I'm going to stop my video so you can see the whole screen. Okay, so we've got this scene. And I've got a camera set up here that's just kind of looking down on it. So I just wanted to make like a little miniature set. I never intended this to look like a big um, film studio. Like it was never meant to feel life-size. So that's why I set the camera up a little higher. I gave it a little bit of a telephoto uh, look to it. So it felt like we were kind of zoomed in on it. Um, there wasn't really too much of an opportunity for me to give too much depth of field here, but you can kind of see it. Um, and I'm going to keep my, uh, I'm going to keep the, let's slide this over here. Oh. I'm going to go ahead and keep the, uh, render window rather small so that, um, we can continue working in this and you guys, uh, and also, like I said, I'm running on an old school, uh, MacBook. And I want to make sure that it stays updated. So this is just a scene. I went ahead and threw just like a sky dome light in here. You can see uh, it's just set to like an expo. It's just base level stuff. So this is this is cool. This is great and everything. Um, but this isn't gonna. This isn't great lighting. So the first thing that I wanted to do, because again, there's no ceiling, no roof on this thing, and you guys are gonna run into a situation like this occasionally. Is like how do you? get light into these windows that simulates like a sky dome that we have, but, but this isn't the way a sky dome would look in a room. It's just kind of going everywhere all the time. So the first thing that I would do is I would go ahead 
so we might keep that open. Is I'm gonna go ahead and create a portal light. So what a portal light does, for anyone that doesn't know, is, so here's the sky dome. You can see it's just kind of everywhere, shining all over everything. But if I go ahead and, and have that selected and I go up to Arnold and lights and then create a light portal, what that does, and you must have the sky dome created, is it's gonna create something that looks like an area light. Now, what is this light? Is this an area light? No, this is taking that sky dome light and minimizing it down to just one, um, just like one little area. So like, I'm gonna flip this around 180. So if I wanted this to just shine in through these windows, I would just take this and zero this right in here. And what this does is this, this con condenses, well, you can do like, I mean, you could make this an area light, but what this does is this condenses all of the um, samples that normally would be going everywhere in this, uh, in this scene and it centers them down to just outside that window. In fact, let me go ahead and turn this off. So the sky dome, it's just like a one in the camera. We're gonna go ahead and make that zero. So now you can kind of see this light coming through here. So now I can take this portal light and let's see. This would be in the shape now, range then, I suppose. <laughs> So we can also do this. We can also go in the um, light manager here in Arnold and we can take this and we can take a look at the intensity and we can jack up the exposure if we want. And now you can see that it's really feeling like lights shining in through this window, these windows, as opposed to um, coming in from uh, like kind of everywhere. So that's a really good technique to do on something like that. And it's also really helps um, because it'll it maintains that look of the overall sky because oftentimes what we'll see is like super sharp shadows in here if you're doing like a smaller area light or something like that but what we're missing is like this kind of softness this kind of just feeling that there's light everywhere but kind of zeroing in on this one area now if i wanted to take this around here and let's say um, actually, let's let's take this back here and we'll keep this as just like just like a fill light. So we won't want it to be too too high. And we're gonna go ahead and open up this door. And and we're gonna let light pour in there. We're gonna say like the key lights kind of pouring in there. Man, I keep doing that. There we go. Let's open up the door. And we'll open it just a little bit. Now what I would do in this particular case is I would go ahead and create a key light or a spotlight. And now I know that everyone doesn't like to work this way, but I like to look through the light and then position this around where I want it to go. Now, as you can see, like nothing is updating over here. It's because in this spotlight, um, if you go into the Arnold tab, the exposure by default is set to zero. Um, and you wanna just kind of crank that up. And then you're gonna to wanna to start to kind of tone that in just a little bit there. Now you can see this is like looking pretty super sharp there. And that's not something that we want to see or like, cause we want it to be a little bit softer than that. So we want to go ahead and open up this radius a little bit. Um, that's a little bit too much. And then I would just kind of like, if I wanted this to be the, um, Oh, weird. Just my signature. No, thank you. Just go ahead and open up the color picker, please. So I'm going to set the sky dome to be a little bit cooler and then I'll have that light coming in the side to be a little bit warmer. Weird. Give me just a second there. That's kind of freaking out here. Gives me a chance to look over, see if there's anyone any questions. Can I have two portal lights on a single sky dome? You know what? That's a good question. I don't believe so. I don't think you can. I think in my, in my previous test of something like that, I don't think you can. Let's try it again. See if I can create Arnold. 
lights like portal. You know, it looks like it works actually. You know, let's go ahead and make a second portal light for this instead of this one. See if that works. Maybe they updated that, but for some reason, I remember years ago that that did not work. Let's see. Let's go ahead and check out the light manager here. You know what? Portal. Huh. It may have broken it. Broken it. Breaking it. Broke, broke it. Broke it. This doesn't seem to be working as much anymore. And I'm not seeing it here in the light list. So I'm wondering. Hmm. Let's see. I you know, it may have, it may have worked, but it seemed to kind of break there. So I would, I, I would be leery of that. Um, and then for, we've got this key light coming in. Let's go ahead and make it little warm, not too much. And then we will go ahead and crank up this exposure a little bit more. That's a little too yellow for me. We're going to make that a little more orange. And then go and look through that a little bit more. And what I'm, what I'm not liking is that hard line coming down the wall. Let's see what we want to do. If we want to push that into the room a little bit more. Yeah, that's looking a little bit better. And then for this light, we're going to go ahead and make this a little bit cooler. Oh, this light picker is going crazy. You guys see this? I'm like selecting it and it's jumping to the other side. Huh. Wait, wacky. All right, we'll leave that as is for now. But that's basically going to be my setup for if I want some like light coming in this way and then some additional skylight coming in there. What I want to do now is, oh, looks like I'm crashing. Yay. All right, so we'll go ahead and wait for that to crash out. Yay. Yeah, no, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to really want to do it. So give this a second to fire up my again. Uh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to, to want to, doesn't seem to like that very much at all. So do you guys have any other questions before I relaunch this? Oh yeah, that crashed. Let's see if this works to open this one. All right. Seems to have worked to open this back up. Did it though? Did it? So let this pinwheel go. Okay. So now we are back in the scene. Got things humming along. So now there's two other main light sources that I really want to tackle in this. Um, there's this computer screen. And there's this, or there's three really. There's this computer screen. There's this lamp. And there are these stars on the walls. So the first one that I want to tackle is a computer screen. So if you guys are seeing my monitor still, I opened up some uh, some reference images of a computer screen. Right, I'm going to hide my video so you guys can see. So when you're looking at screen reference, it's a really tricky one because you can kind of go anywhere that you want because like something like this. This image, where you see the screen perfectly and it's perfectly exposed, this is the, the room around it, that's not a real image. That's like a Photoshopped image for an advertisement, right? So like, they're trying to sell that the image is beautiful, so they kind of like slap it in as a separate element to balance with everything else. Um, versus what you would actually see, no, I would, I, would, I would not like to say this to Pinterest. There we go. Which would be something more like this, where you wouldn't see a lot of detail on the screen. Although this doesn't feel real to me either. This feels like they pulled up a white screen. 
um, what feels more real to me would be something like this, where it's bright and overexposed, but you can still kind of see some stuff on the screen, right? Like something along this line would feel about right to me. But it seems like in references, you're either seeing this, which again, feels pretty right, or you're seeing something like this, which just feels foreign and alien to me. So that, that comes up a lot in interior spaces when you're seeing light outside and when you're looking at screens. Because ultimately what happens is normally when I would, if I was taking the scene and I was like, okay, I've got this computer here, I would know I'd, I would need to do a couple of uh, passes on it. So one pass would be a, the image itself on the screen. Like I would swap out the texture on the screen with something else. And then I would um, comp that in as a separate element in the shot. The reason why I'd want to do that is you want to add like a little bit of reflection onto the lens. You want to drop it back into the screen by adding a little drop shadow around the edge. But in terms of the lighting of the screen itself, I would, uh, in this particular case, I would create an area light. And put that over top, like kind of mimic that exactly where the screen is. And the reason why, so the, and I'll show you this in just a second. There's a couple of things that you could have done. And one of them is you could take the texture of the screen. Like I can, I can go into the shader of this and I can take this white and go to the emission That's too big. Hold on. Ooh, ooh. Make sure I drop my render size down to something more reasonable. Because I don't need to see that it's all it's big and beautiful glory yet. Oh, we still got the. Um, we're just going to turn this off for now. So what I could have done. Let's take this move that out of the way for a second. So let's say I wanted to take the face of this and I wanted to add a new material to it and I wanted to make it a AI surface shader. And then I want to take that and I want to jack up the emission on it. I'm like, yeah, let's go crazy. I can't turn that to, oh yeah, see? Now that's looking, that's looking really cool. That's kind of what I want, right? The problem with that is I have very little control over a few things. I have very little control over the sample size of, of just that shader and being able to control all this noise that's emitting around there. I also have very little uh, uh, an opportunity to kind of change the look of that light. Like if I haven't, because everything that you do, everything that you set up has to be adjustable to an art director or a director or whoever you're working with. So if, the, if they're like, oh, you know what, we kind of need it to feel bigger, like it's, it's, it's uh, you know, affecting more of the room or something. You can't really adjust that. Like the only way I could adjust that is if I, I would have to like, take the geometry and like actually make it bigger or something. Um, and that's no good. So I, or you would adjust it in a comp and then it always just kind of looks janky. So ultimately what I would always do in this situation would be to take an area light, put it in its place. And then I have all of the controls of that light um, already inherently in it. So I can just take the exposure and I can turn this up and you can get the same look, but now I can take this and I can, I can take it, you know, make it much smaller. If, if I just like really wanted to kind of get like a super tight look on a character, make it look like he's looking into like a really fine thing, that's great. Or I can make this much bigger and make it a bigger, broader um, light that's gonna kind of overtake the room. And again, like just, just more control over, that's too much over what exactly it is that this is affecting. Because again, I know that once I get to the comp, I will be able to um, control those values, or the value of the screen a little bit by comping that in as well. So again, it would just be like a color element and then like some ambient occlusion around the edges and then a reflection pass to get that and I can get some reflection on the screen as well. So that's, that's how I would handle, that's usually how I handle any type of screen, you know, TVs, computer monitors, um, any kind of large surface like that. Um, now in terms of this lamp over here, 
So looking at some lamp reference, one of the things that you really notice is the variation in the lamp itself, right? Like you see, you kind of see three distinct shapes all the time. You see like this thing coming out the bottom, you see light spilling out the top, and then you want to see the, like where the bulb is under the shade. Oh, so I have some questions here. Let me go ahead and check some questions. Can you use a combination of both? Use emission and an area light for your screen. Yes, but, but um, watch out, but the emission will create a lot of noise. So that's, that's the one problem of it. You certainly can, like if you can, if, if you have a scene that you can control um, and, and the noise isn't problematic or the, the chatter isn't problematic, yeah, you can definitely, you can definitely do both. Let's see if there's any other questions here. Uh, ba -ba -ba, Katarina Perez says, I noticed in Spies in Disguise, windows and doors seem to be a bit overexposed. Is that more of a stylistic choice for that particular film? Um, yes and no. Like, because we do have that choice when we're, when we're making stuff. Um, but it's more based on a kind of a photorealism thing. So if you think about camera exposures, um, so our eye, the human eye is incredible, right? We have the ability to see, um, we have the ability to, our eye can adjust things very, very, very quickly, right? Like we can, look inside our space and look inside a room and have our eye adjusted for that and then uh, uh, immediately look outside and have our eye reformat and see what's outside. Cameras, especially still cameras and film cameras, don't have that capability. They have to either choose. Do you want to be like properly exposed to the interior or do you want to be properly exposed to the exterior? And depending on what's going on in the interior of the room, like this is an example of, of them exposing for the exterior and we're just getting, like most of the room is pretty dark. So in reality, if we're exposing for the interior space, this outside space is just gonna get blown a tall heck. Um, and anytime that you see something like this, um, you're, this isn't, this is more uh, shot with, so what, what you end up doing in interior photography if you're trying to show off a space is you'll shoot the room with like eight different exposures and then you kind of piece them together. So this exterior space is a different exposure than the interior. Same thing with something like this here. So this, this isn't what this, like if you shot this with one image, this is not what you would see. Um, here is a CG render of something. So it's kind of like, it's kind of the same thing where that outside, it just doesn't quite feel right. It doesn't feel, feel really accurate. So it's more about it being uh, more photo real, but yeah, it, it's, that was, that was because we were kind of going that way with that film. It was more of a stylistic choice. Asha, these sessions are awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, uh, I am just testing this out. So I'm happy if you guys uh, like this and I'll keep doing stuff like this. I'll do like some character lighting next week or something. Okay. So for the lamps, the three things I always look at, light coming out the top, light coming out the bottom and the variation on the shade itself. So if I go ahead and just throw um, cause again, I haven't actually done this yet. <laughs> if I just like throw a point light in there and I tone it up, we'll get, let's just see what happens. That's usually just where I start, where I kind of, um, get up in here and doo -doo -doo. Well, we are outside that lamp. There we go. I'm doing an excellent job placing this. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. I'm very, very good at this. I am a professional. Here we go. <laughs> so let's say, you know, you can see uh, my modeling skills also awesome. I just kind of left that hanging there. So I'm just gonna like put it, like mock up where the light bulb would be in there. I don't ask, you know, if I wanted to go crazy, I could do the actual geometry in there. Um, but you know, I think, I think we're good to fake it. That feels a little bit high. So let's go and drop that down. Um, now what we're gonna do, is go and fire up the renderer. Um, again, it's black because that is what happens when you use a Maya light in Arnold because the exposure is set to zero. You gotta flip down this tab. Um, you wanna jack it up. And what you're seeing, or what I'm seeing here is out of the gate, is I'm seeing that shape which is working pretty well down there. Ooh, now I'm inside of something. And that's actually like, that's working pretty well down here. Now I'm seeing this shadow from this, and that's not great. And overall, uh, it's just a little bit super harsh. Oh, go back to it. Doo, 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 doo. And of course, when I'm lighting, I would not just say this name. I would call this 
light bulb lamp or something that is much better. <laughs> so we've got places back in there. So what we're seeing is like these harsh lines, right? And harsh lines is like, I, you never want to see that. Because like if you're going back to a reference, like there are no hard lines in any of this stuff. Maybe this here, but that's because the bulb is exposed and it's very, very close to the wall. But all of these shapes, super soft. And it, maybe that one, because again, bare bulb close to the wall. But what I want is I want to kind of soften that up a little bit. So we always want to uh, check the radius of the light. Whoa, that's too big. So now when I'm starting to see stuff like this, this is the radius of the light is now penetrating the lamp itself. Okay, that's more what we want. So what you don't want is, yeah, like this type of thing, like that weirdness, light penetrating geo, not great. So I wanna make sure that's smaller than that. Tone it down. This is pretty extreme. In the um, in the amount of light that there is, and that's just usually kind of how I work. I just like I usually make them ten times more than I would ever actually want, and then I just kind of start to dial it in from there. And now, this feels a little bit better in here. And the one thing that we're not seeing again, so this is this is feeling pretty pretty accurate with or pretty pretty much what I wanted with the three things. I've got the light coming out the bottom. I've got a little light spilling on the top. But you know what? Like, why aren't I seeing the light shining through the shader? Um, it's because the shader's not quite set up for it. So what we want to do, let me go ahead and just throw a new shader on there. Um, and I always just use the AI standard surface shader, like 99 times out of 100. Um, and then what we want is we want, um, ba -da -ba -ba -ba, we want it to transmit a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and turn this up. And go and start to play around with this. Now, let's see. So this is one of my little tricks here too. It's not one of my tricks, it's just one of the tricks. So like, as you can see, when I started adding this, this is just like perfectly like see-through and you can actually see the, the lamp, the lamp like stick, I guess, <laughs> the lamp stand. Um, and you don't really see that in any of these because this surface is, is super diffused. Um, and so what I want to do is I just kind of want to rough it up a little bit. So I add a little bit of extra roughness. Um, and now what we're seeing is, and again, this isn't like super highly detailed. Uh, this isn't super crazy. Again, this is just like a simple cone. If I was doing this as like a photo real thing, what I would, what I'd want to do next is put in some of these, like, um, you can see some texture in the lampshade here. You can see the lampshade texture there. You can also see where the wire frames are on some of these. So I would put those in. But for the purpose of, of this like kind of abstract scene, uh, this, is feeling, this is feeling pretty good. So I feel like that would be about right. Um, and then let me go ahead and let's do something else. You know what, let's, I'm gonna try one scene, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add this to the next light that I'm gonna do, um, which is uh, which is actually the stars in the wall here. So we'll, we'll leave that as is for right now. We'll see how these play together. So we got these lights on the wall. I'm sorry, these stars on the wall. Um, and I was thinking it would be kind of cool if in our scene, go back to our perspective here. Render camera. Oh, weird. Oh, yeah. Okay, there we go. So now we've got this off to the screen hand, right hand side. I want all of these uh, stars to kind of glow. Um, so the one thing that we can do is there's, there's a couple things. There's also like there's the emission trick that we learned earlier where I could take all of these and let's see, I could go ahead and uh, create a new material. Um, ba, 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 ba. Iron surface. And I could put some emission on, on this. Oh. Oh, I've got a silly thing with my computer where every time I open the color picker, it gives me that pop-up window now. I don't know what that is. It's wacky. 
um, you know, you can, you can jack this up. Um, and then I would take that, let's see, I'd, I'd apply this existing shader, which is that. And then I would select all of them, say that. And now they all would be like this glowing light based on the shader. But like, as we know, there's the emission problem that we were having before. And so this can work if the, if the stars are like, you know, kind of glowing up a little bit. Like if they're just like a normal, because emission's not like inherently bad, right? Like if, if we just want them to be like glow in the dark and we just want them to be a little bit kind of glowy, um, that's totally fine. But if I wanted to, uh, let's, let's say I wanted to make most of them a little bit kind of like a neon green glowy. That's what I wanted to do. Man, my computer is really unhappy with, um, with this color picker tonight. Let's make it like that. So it's making like a little bit kind of like neon-y, um, like, stars like you like you're like you'd find in a kid's room you have the value about I'll take that value down eh, maybe not that much take that and then you know we'll actually lower this to point two now let's say that we, uh, let's say like this star right there that's like the main one. Yeah, these are still too bright. Let's take this down to point. Let's go by. Okay, let's say this star right here, I want it to be, actually, let's make it on the other side of the room. Let's say this one right here is like the main character star. And that's a super awesome one that we definitely want to glow up. Um, so what I would do is I would, instead of uh, making it glow with an emission, I would actually turn that piece of geometry into a light source by, making it, by having it selected and clicking mesh light. What the mesh light does is it, you can see it here, it actually turns that piece of geo into a light source that you can have all of the controls of any other uh, light. And now it, it kind of maintains the shape of that star. And now I can add a little bit of like, and I can see like, oh man, look at those super harsh shadows. Not great, not great at all. But what I can do is I can, can I increase the, radius of this a little bit? I guess I would have to, oh, I guess that's kind of a thing. So I guess that makes sense, right? Like you want it to, to be um, the same size of the actual object. So in order to make that, I would have to make it bigger. Oh, huh. that's not, not great. So I guess what I would do in that scenario is I would set it up as, I would kind of mock it up a little bit. I would make this what I would need it to be to make the star itself look right. And then I would create, you know, you can create like a point light that's right there that doesn't, Maybe that, I think that light might be, yeah, it's on the other side of the wall here. It might be, there we go. Yeah, see, that's why I was like, I was like, I wonder why I can't see it. Oof. It's because it is on the other side of the wall. Now I would be able to start to kind of control this a little bit more as the main light source. And then I can take this radius and increase it a little bit to get some more softening. And just kind of mock it up so it's not like, it's not as technically sound. And then what I would do, hmm, this is where it gets a little tricky. I would probably take this and then not light link it to, to just some of those, yeah, to allow that star to kind of glow up a little bit. Yeah, this is where it kind of gets tricky. Let's turn it down a little bit. And then 
maybe I can tone this down and then take that mesh light and tone that back up. And then we can get a good combination of the two. Kind of get like a best of both worlds kind of a thing. There we go. So now this is still kind of glowing and it's creating more light around it. This radius down. And now you're kind of getting a little bit of the best of both worlds there. Now we're getting some stars on the walls. Uh, we can bring in some light from the outside. We can open up that door and get some light in there. Um, and now this is starting to feel like a scene that we might actually want to light. So let's see what time is it. I want to keep these relatively short. Ooh, 45 minutes in. Um, because I don't want them to go on for too long. I also lose my voice very easily, it turns out, or I have been <clears throat> recently. So I don't want to uh, kill myself the next day. <laughs> so I can't talk in meetings or anything. Uh, but yeah, so that's a basic setup of how I approach those light sources. Uh, let me check to see if we have any questions before I move on. Um, let's see, okay, I was go through these. A few more. Uh, huh. So let me refresh this real quick. There we go. Okay. Uh, can, uh, okay. I was super curious because I really like how this helped direct more focus of the characters while keeping their photos. Yeah. So I mean, we we balance that a lot in the film. Was like how much uh, to blow out the 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 uh, outside the windows versus the character. Because again, we were looking for abilities to create shaping, light over dark, dark over light, that kind of thing. Let me turn my camera back on here so I'll stop sharing my screen so you don't have to look at your own questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had, you know, because in a lot of those situations, we wanted to create a dark character over a light background. And so in order to do that, we would expose out for the, the, the outside and the exterior. It's also kind of a, a fun trick to do if, um, if you don't have a lot of time to model very detailed things outside. You can just put some shapes out there and that helps out that too. Agreed, I love this section. I would love to see a session of character lighting in different moods as well. Cool, yeah, I can definitely do that. I've been taught to avoid using mesh lights due to noise and render issues, but do studios use this as a common way to light? So I don't use uh, Arnold in, in the studio too often. Um, I don't generally use, yeah, I mean, I don't generally use mesh lights all that often because they're a little bit gimmicky for me. There's, there's, there's very rare circumstances where I would actually use them. Usually I, what I would do is create a shader of the object to allow it to kind of look like it's glowing and then use a light source, kind of what I was doing there uh, in order to uh, make, it, make it glow. Because you could see that like the limitation that I ran into, right? Like I was like, cool, I can make it. And I know I just want to soften up the shadows. Oh no, I don't have that option. I can't soften the shadows without actually changing the geometry of the light. So. Uh, yeah, so you, you generally don't necessarily want to use um, photo mesh lights, but like I said, I was just goofing around with it in there. Does increasing the radius of a point light turning it into a sphere light? So um, a point light is an interesting thing. So a point light without um, a radius, uh, it, like, it doesn't really exist. And, and there really is no like circle light or sphere light. Um, but that's essentially what it is. So they, when they created a point light, the idea, like everyone always said this, like, oh, it's like a light bulb. It's like a light bulb. You just put a light bulb anywhere, but it's not because it's infinitely small, which isn't real. All lights have some radius to them. Um, so yeah. So if, if you want to think about it as a sphere that emits light, that's totally what it is. Um, it's just a matter of how big and how small you make that sphere. Um, I was realizing that I could have just, I was, I had lamps examples. I could have just like held this one up to the screen to see how this looks and, could have shown you that like this, this is actually kind of oh, move a little closer so you can see yeah you can see like the texture in this you can see the, the line going down here um, you can also see like the the brushed metal the texture that you can see the reflection up in here which would be like this would be the killer for me because that would mean I would actually need to go in there and actually model stuff so you can see it in the reflections there um, let's see if there's any other questions before moving on but yeah so that's pretty much it um, like I said I'll keep doing these. I will keep um, showing you guys some character setups. I will do a little bit more with reference. Um, 
and we'll keep going from there. Cause I really do feel like this is the best way to learn is just to kind of watch somebody work. Um, and then hopefully I can, uh, we can bring in some guests to, to do some of these as well. Cause I think these are very cool, but yeah, if you guys have a better name for this than Mikey lights it, then I would love to hear that because I just, I wrote that the first time. And, uh, and I don't like saying it out loud. I don't think that much, but if it sticks, it sticks. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so keep going, keep lighting on Wednesday. Okay. This is the schedule this week on Wednesday. I'm going to release an interview I, I did, uh, with the, uh, department supervisor of animation at Pixar. Her name is Becky Tower. She's phenomenal. I've known her for a very long time and she's one of my favorite all time people. And she's so smart and so compassionate and so kind. Um, and she shared some wisdom of what they look for when they're hiring Pixar animators and just kind of her approach to animation as a whole. So really cool stuff. Um, Friday, we'll be doing some critiques. So keep your images posting, keep them going. And if you have any questions, uh, let us know. So stay safe out there, everyone. And we look forward to hearing from you soon. All right. Happy lighting, everyone.